Welcome to Hockey Nights in Vegas, episode 74, brought to you as always by the Las Vegas Advisor, www.lasvegasadvisor.com, and by my good friend, Dr. John Pierce, concierge medicine for you and the stars at www.agelessforever.net. Well, kids, we're down to 10 games to go. The pressure is uh, fully on. The Golden Knights are 39 wins, 25 losses, 8 overtime losses. They have 86 points. They are currently 4 points behind the Nashville Predators for the first wild card spot, but they are only 1 point behind the Los Angeles Kings, who have a game in hand for 3rd place in the Pacific Division. So before we get dig deep into what's going on uh, with the Golden Knights, they finished up a homestand, uh, three, one, three up and one down. They lost against Tampa Bay, which may have been the best game that they played of the four. So they kind of held serve and did what they did. Um, and then they are in the midst of, I would probably venture to say, the key road trip uh, of the year that's going to determine, A, if they make the playoffs, and B, who they're going to play. They started the road trip with a barely dominant win against St. Louis. It went back and forth. St. Louis scored late, and then there was the traditional Jonathan Marcheseau uh, overtime goal to pad his salary request for next year. Uh, last night was a bit of a disaster, and we'll get into that as a separate topic, but where is your head at with the Golden Knights, not the standings, but the state of play after that sort of couple episodes where we were really down on just about all aspects of the game. Is, is their game back in order, Lindsay? Uh, I'd say that it's better in a lot of areas. I, I think the, the scoring has been there. The dampening of the goals against has certainly been there. I thought Logan Thompson played unbelievable against the St. Louis Blues and has probably set himself up for a, a goalie heater uh, when he's allowed to go back in the net. It was a little puzzled why he wasn't in the net last night, but I understand why Bruce didn't put him in either. But uh, I still have retention questions with this team, whether it's retaining a lead, retaining a zone, retaining a level of consistency. Uh, and so I'm encouraged by some of the steps that I'm seeing taken, especially now that Noah Hannafin isn't playing on a pairing with Alex Petrangelo. love that. Uh, but I still have a lot of reservations about the true longevity of this team because I just see way too many instances where the opposition just pushes their way in front of the net and does whatever they want. And I don't know how much of that formula you can really change in the final 10 and if they do make the playoffs, uh, if, if that's something that can be ramped up once uh, the game does itself. Jeff, how's the state to play for the Golden Knights? Well, I'm I'm not like entirely down on them, but I'm not like, hey, they've turned the corner. Let's go on a Stanley Cup run. I think the concerns for me are that first of all, they played six games in nine days, which is wild. A lot. It's a lot of hockey. And I think, you know, last night in that third period, I think they just ran out of juice a little bit. But I think there are some concerns of those six games that we've recently seen since that devil's game on St. Patrick's day, they beat the three teams they were supposed to beat. They beat three teams, Seattle, New Jersey, and Columbus. The problem is, and, and the team that was behind them in St. Louis. So they've beaten the four teams that are out of the playoffs. They've lost to the two teams that are playoff teams right now in the Tampa Bay Lightning, in which they gave up a two-on-O shorthanded goal. And then last night, blowing a three-goal lead in the third period. You know what's funny? I thought that there were some similarities to the third period against the Kraken in Seattle, a game which they were up. They gave up the three goals. They pushed the overtime and ended up winning in overtime. I thought there were some similarities to, to that game in that they were up three goals in that game. They started with a power play, or they had a very early power play in that period, which was absolutely garbage. And then they gave up the three straight goals. 
they may end up losing the game in overtime. So there, there were some similarities in that the power play gave away momentum, which I think is not something that you can navigate very well against good teams like Nashville, who, what is it now? 18 points in, in, in 18 points in consecutive games, which is, and, and only two of them have been losses. So this is a team that's basically 16, two and O or I'm sorry, 16, O and two in their last 18. I mean, that's, that's insanity, but I think last night they ran out of gas in the third period. I thought Yuri Patera for as well as he played in the first two periods of that game. And he made some big saves, especially in that first period. He wasn't great in the third period. And some of that has to do with, I think the fact like Lindsay pointed out, guys were just pushed out of the way in front of the net. It's hard for goalies to make saves when the, the guys in front of them aren't making it difficult for the other team to score. I didn't like, I, I, I will come to the defense here a little bit. And I think that, I think the referees kind of fucked up last night's game because I thought that on the, on the Zucker goal, I thought he was offside. Um, you know, we saw multiple replays, one from an overhead where it clearly looked like the puck was ahead of the blue line before Zucker got there. And then I thought the the line that for whatever reason isn't right at the blue line, it's kind of angled a little bit. It looked like he beat the puck across the blue line as well. So I thought it was a good challenge. I thought the Golden Knights were unfortunate to not win that challenge. I mean, look, it was really, really close, and I know you can't guess. I just think they got it wrong. The problem is Bruce tells these guys, hey, look, we're going to challenge this. And if we lose, you understand that we are now on the, the penalty kill. They got beaten way too easily on that power play. They lost a puck battle. They couldn't clear the puck out of, out of the zone. St. Louis ends up scoring a, a, a really nice goal on, on the power play. What did I say? St. Louis. Nashville scores a really nice goal on the power play. I just thought that special teams kind of blew that game for them last night in the third period. And, and I thought Bruce made the right decision to challenge. I thought he was right. It turns out the referees didn't agree with him or I. But the Golden Knights got to do a better job of defending on that penalty kill. Knowing what's at stake, I think they have to be better in that situation. I'm still concerned with the the defense. They just it's everything. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's, everything. It, it, it's their identity. I mean that's mm-hmm. you know that's where they that's where they butter their bread. And you know, have you guys seen those new Ray-Ban meta glasses that have the camera in them and, and and the microphones and you can take calls and stuff like that. I bought them. Now I don't I don't have them yet, but I'm going to donate them to Shea Theodore so that we can get a really great view of the overtime goal as Roman Yossi skated past him like he was really just sort of not on the ice. But yeah, that was a two on three goal, by the way. Yeah, I mean, he's he just, they were just, you know, the, they were the Aaron Ekblad Memorial traffic cone. <laughs> and we've seen that a few times with Shea recently, which I think is concerning. It, it's in. Uh, he's listen, been brutal. He's He's been brutal on the defensive side of the puck. But since he's been back in the lineup, he has 19 points in 18 games. Yeah, I don't, I, I mean. But it, the the thing is. The defensive lapses are hugely noticeable, and the points are just what you expect from him. So that's kind of where it is. This team just, they're not tough. And it's funny because in the last episode, we wondered about Braden McNabb. Is he hurt or something like that? And he ban- he goes out and pancakes two St. Louis Blues and has a pretty solid uh, bout with whichever Shen it is. I can't remember. I think it was Braden no. Yeah, but whoever the captain of the Blues is, a, a, a spirited tussle. And we were just literally talking a couple of days before. We haven't really seen him stick somebody to the boards. And he plastered two guys. Perfectly clean hits, right? But they they don't have the identity anymore, it seems like, of a team that's tough to play against. Mm-hmm. The scoring's coming around a little bit. They're, that's wonderful. 
Um, I think for the first time in 12 episodes, I don't have to ask you the goalie controversy question. I think, like Lindsay said, Logan Thompson was outstanding against St. Louis. And Aiden Hill is going to have a tough time regaining the 1A spot if Logan Thompson continues to perform at that level. And they're going to give him, I feel like, 10 games to go, every opportunity to continue to perform at that level. Well, I think if I'm Bruce, you year. have to. You you got to ride him into the mud. You have to. You right? have to pick. Somebody has to reveal themselves, and that's right. what you're working for. Like it's up to the goalies to decide. And Aiden Hill, we don't even know what his health status is. First of all, we know he didn't travel. Um, right. Right. It, but but that's where it's like the, everything's so tweaky with both of these guys when they get hurt. It's like they get hurt and we're like ah two weeks, and you bring him back in two weeks. Ah, it's actually six. And if we would have waited four, it probably would have been four. But we did it at two. But he isn't playing well enough or confident enough for me to be like, all right, let's figure you out. There's not enough time left. There's straight up not enough time. And you have to give Logan the chance to take it and run with it. And what's transpired over the last couple of games, the fact that Hill had to go out with an injury, he goes in and then has the game that he does against St. Louis. He has several big-time saves, including that one uh, on the penalty shot that led directly to the other end. Those are the things that get him going. Like there's a little bit of a savior complex to his goalie personality. Be like, Oh, I'll come in. I'll save the day. I'll be a badass. Like it's that being ordained like that, I think does that something for him. And so now you just raise the tight rope that he's kind of walking on. And Bruce is trying to make sure that you're, you're keeping things balanced on both sides. Cause he was very complimentary of Logan's game. And then last night, he says those games happen. We know that there's a psychological prodding that's going on on a day-by-day basis with this team. But if your goalie goes on a heater and is capable of some of the saves that he's capable of, you'd be surprised how many pockets of relief that creates, even for the defensemen that are just keen on not really making the net front a, a, a house that you shouldn't want to knock a door on. I, th- I, don't, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm glad that LT has stepped up. Because, Mm -hmm. you know, he is probably the more fragile of the goalies when it comes to the mental state of things. And he, when he gets down on himself, it's a mess. It's just, Mm -hmm. it's just a messy situation. And we'll never know how affected he was by sort of permanently losing the crease and how affected he was by the run that Aiden Hill went on and the raise that he got and everything like that. But it was really good to see him get his mind clear and put up the performance that, A, was required in that game. He made huge saves. That game could have Mm -hmm. easily, as has been with the Golden Knights a couple of times before, these games could have got out of hand really, really early. And versus Bennington, too. Let's not forget that added level of drama because, like, gamers love to to have that friction against one another, too. That helps. So – I, I, I'm okay with them riding him out. I don't have the schedule up. I have the standings up. I don't know if they have any more back-to-backs this season, but I, I feel so. I feel like they are going to, well, out of necessity right now, uh, literally just ride Logan Thompson until you know either the, either the wheels come off or you know the, they go as far as they go. With Aiden Hill's injury, like you said, they are they were extra coy. Right. They didn't they didn't even say tests the next day. They didn't they just said not traveling and well he's been in and out of the lineup what three times this year? Yeah. No, the third time. And 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 that doesn't I don't that he missed time last year too. Correct. I mean I look at last night's game back to back travel. But the process wasn't too bad the first two periods. They uh, they definitely ran out of gas a little bit. And, you know, Uncle Mo, that's momentum for you that don't know what we're going to talk about right here. Uh, I mean, that's a big thing. And, and Nashville is feeling very full of themselves and very justifiably so. Um, you know, ever since they didn't get a chance to see you two here in town back about a month ago. They've just, they've been on an absolute heater. 
that game felt to me like a game that if they played a seven game series, they might all be like that. They might mm-hmm. all have those giant momentum swings back, back and forth. Right now, Nashville's the better team against the Golden Knights second string goalie without the captain and Thomas Hurdle. Are they a clear favorite in a seven game series in the playoffs? I don't think so. What do you think, Lindsay? If it was the roster that the Golden Knights would roll out today. No, the yeah. playoff roster. The playoff roster. Right, which would also, I assume, include Alex Petrangelo as well. No, right. I yeah, I suppose. But in terms of teams probably at the top of the list that I don't want to face at this point of the year, they're probably near the top of it. And for the reason you said, those, those comebacks, no lead is safe. I mean, there was that fear with Edmonton the last couple of years, even last year where – Maybe it was the year before. I don't even know where the playoff scoring really just took off, at least for the first couple of rounds. And the people, it was like eight, nine. They were playing the Kings, this I know, because the goaltending was awful. And when you have that, and the Golden Knights, I feel, had that last year too, where it felt like third periods, even if they were down, that they were going to find a way. I don't have that feeling about them this year. But with Nashville playing as well as they have, and again, I'll stand by this like I did a few weeks ago, they're selling their long-term future for this run, probably to the second round to lose, right? Yep. But you got to you got to give your players a chance, otherwise, why are you really in this business? And so, um, but they were the Golden Knights were the bullies for those first two periods. They were getting wide open looks in the slot. Those those first couple goals that we saw the first period, I was just like, holy shit! Just buy a whole beachfront property while you're there is unbelievable. But they were the higher pressure, the higher energy, they were the harder working team. And whether they ran out of gas at the end or not, I mean, that's a great way to have an excuse, but like you, every point matters, especially against teams like these. And so I'm not really willing to let them off the hook as much as, as other people are. But, um, as we, we started to talk about, uh, there, there are better bones to their game. It's just finding that consistency for 60 minutes. Right. Chap. Yeah, and, and look, I'll, I'll be frank. I don't know if I'd want to see Nashville in the first round either. Yeah. Not only because they're – they're. I mean, look, Vegas isn't going to play them in the first round. But, I mean, look, I think they're a team that has some star players. They're, they're a team that has some guys who like the bright lights, Philip Forsberg, Roman Yossi, Ryan O'Reilly. Uh, look, their big gun scored goals for them last night. So I think they showed up. But the other aspect of this is – I think UC Soros in the playoffs is a dangerous proposition for any team on the other side of, of the rink because of the fact that he's, he's, he's elite. Like he is an elite goalie. And I think anytime you play an elite goalie in the playoffs, I think you, you have reason to be a little nervous because you never know when that elite goalie is going to go from, I mean, it's stupid, right? Turn into Superman, despite the fact that he's already Superman in the regular season. So uh, it's a dangerous proposition there. That being said, right now, the Golden Knights will play the Dallas Stars the way it's set up right now, because they leapfrog the Vancouver Canucks for the top seed in the Western Conference. So, I mean, you talk about your dangerous propositions. That's one that you're looking right down the barrel of a gun. And you're probably not really liking what's on the other side. Look, let's be honest. There really aren't any matchups where if you're the Golden Knights, you're you're excited about. And I, I'd say that that's vice versa, too. Because if you're the Dallas Stars and you're like, shit, we just won the number one overall seed in the Western Conference. What do we get? We get the team that kicked our ass last year. And we have to play them in the first round now. So... I think the Golden Knights have put themselves in a really shit position, but by doing so, they've also put some of these top teams in shit positions because I don't know if the Dallas Stars or the Vancouver Canucks or the Colorado Avalanche really want to see Vegas in the first round. If you're Nashville, you're pissing your pants and whistling Dixie because you made the playoffs. You don't give a shit who you play. If you're the Dallas Stars, and you're looking around, you're like, man, here we were hoping we were going to get the Blues or the or the Preds. We got Vegas. Oh, that's not good. So it, it's interesting to, to be in this position right now just because of the fact that the Golden Knights have played the way they have for basically since November. Um, 
you know, I, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, no matter what they end up doing, whether they're, they stay where they're at or they, they catch Nashville for that seventh wild card spot, or they pass LA, they put themselves in a really, really difficult position because not only for the first round, is it going to be extremely difficult, but the path to get back to the Stanley cup final is very, very difficult if they stay in this position. I think, I'm looking at the I'm looking at the West right now, and we can go down the hypothetical highway. If if they catch LA, they get Edmonton. If they don't catch LA as the second wild card, it, they're gonna look. It looks like they'll get Dallas, Vancouver, or Colorado. Dallas has 99 points. Vancouver has 98 with a with one game in hand. And Colorado has 97, also with a game in hand against Dallas. So there's going to be some pretty good teams that are going to be going out in the first round this year. Uh, I mean, and and that's actually in both conferences. I mean, you're looking right down the barrel at Boston, Toronto, uh, you know, on the other side. And, you know, even though the Flyers found another way to lose last night, (laughs) I don't think too many people want to see Torts and the boys because, you know, they're, they're, they're playing pretty well. And they made I don't it want to, to a talk cup about final as an underdog about 10 plus years ago, didn't they? With the There's Rams a lot of game. those. Yeah. There's a lot of those. For the reason you said earlier, chap, it's all about finding that hot goalie. And and some of the elites, you know, they don't show up. Just look at Linus Allmark last year for the Bruins. They probably waited one game too long to make that switch to Swayman. And 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 that kind of uh I think downed their chances of uh, to to Florida and everything. But you're right in terms of the role that really anybody has to get through. There's a lot of teams that are strong. I don't know if there's anybody that's like clean cut in a way where it's like a favorite where in years past, I feel like there has been that element to the oh, I don't think there's a favorite at, I don't think at, all. at all. No, no. And I, and I, I, I think I, that's why the NHL playoffs are the best out of any league because You've had eight seeds win the Stanley Cup. You've had President's Trophy teams with the greatest team ever assembled lose in the first round. I mean, it's not just a recent thing. And, Eddie, you'll remember. I remember the first time the San Jose Sharks made the playoffs. They were terrible, and they slid in, and they ended up playing the Red Wings in the first round. And Archer's Urbe. Yeah turned into fucking Patrick Waugh, and they ended up knocking the Red Wings out of the playoffs. I mean, I know people like a lot of teams in the playoffs in the NBA. To me, I think it waters down the product. I think the NBA has always had too many teams in the playoffs. I think six is probably a good number because the seven and eight seeds in the NBA, they're generally shit anyway. And they're sub five, they're sub 500 teams in the East. They've they've got no chance at beating the top teams in the NBA. So the same attrition as, as NHL playoffs does. Like it's just not the same. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's the physicality. It's the goalie aspect. It's, it's like in baseball, when you have that pitcher who's hot and he has a run in the playoffs, but the difference is you can't go out and throw that guy every single game. Whereas if you're in the NHL and you've got a goalie, you could play that guy all seven games in a series. It's extremely, extremely tough. And that's why, you know, it's. I think it's the best playoffs there is. And that's why we say the, the Stanley Cup, and we're not blowing smoke up anyone's ass when we say it, but it's the hardest trophy in sports to win. It is unbelievably challenging. Mm-hmm. So we won't have the choice. But if I was going to give you, <clears throat> pardon me, the choice, if you're the Golden Knights, who do you want in the first round? Lindsay, oh, don't I got to get this list of teams? I'll go to Chap, chap first. Chap, who do you who who if if I could give you the, I don't want to say dream. That's a dumb word. The ideal matchup for the Golden Knights in in round one of the playoffs. Well, there's a couple of ways to approach it, but I'll go with the easiest way, and that's the Vancouver Canucks. I think a lack of experience by Vancouver certainly gives Vegas an edge. I don't care about all-time history against these teams because, you know what, the Vancouver Canucks team that they were smoking two years ago is obviously not the same Vancouver Canucks team coached by Rick Tockett that's out there today. But I think you want Vancouver because 
They're the least experienced team. And they're a team that you've had success against this season. They played Dallas so long ago. And they look, they swept the season series from the Stars. We got to remember that. They've beaten Stars three times. But I will point out, they lost all three regular season games to the Stars last year, some of them pretty late in the season. And that wasn't an issue for the Golden Knights in the playoffs. I think there's a revenge factor for Dallas that they would they would play into. Look, in Colorado, I think they're the best team in the Western Conference, regardless of what position they're in. I think right now, the way they're playing, and I know they lost last night, but they have won nine of their last ten. They've won nine of their last ten and have lost ground to, to the Dallas Stars. But um, – the way that the way that the Avalanche are built, and this idea that there's a possibility Gabe Landeskog could come back and play in the playoffs, that's a team I want no fucking part of. Let let Winnipeg or Dallas play them in the first round. I don't want to see them at all right now. Hmm. Lindsay. It would be kind of fun to play Colorado in the first round, though. Just to be like, let's just get it out. Let's just let's just settle this right here. Let's just get it out of the way. Stanley Cup winners. But I because I'm not so confident in the switch flipping for the Golden Knights or that everybody's going to like cohesively gel together instantaneously. I'm trying to think of teams that are most likely to self destruct. And so I'm looking obviously at the Edmonton Oilers because of goaltending and all that other stuff. But then. I kind of think the Kings too, and I don't know how the seedings work out. I don't even know if it's fully possible, but the Kings and the Jets, you want to talk about revenge factor. Those are two teams that have regularly run into the Golden Knights and the Golden Knights have usually come out with an upper hand, whether that's in a regular season or a playoff series, what have you. Winnipeg was a little bit more recent last year, but they don't have Pierre-Luc Dubois. And, but LA does. And so I would maybe kind of, Put that pressure on L.A. because I think that they're probably the most desperate out of everybody, probably besides Edmonton. Edmonton's like cup or bust. But if L.A. doesn't make the conference final with all of the work that they've put in in the last couple of years, it's free agency, trade acquisitions and everything. This is supposed to be blooming time. And so I kind of want to root for either the Jets or the Kings, even though I don't know if they're logistically possible. I think Winnipeg is. Winnipeg, Winnipeg is, is possible, yeah. But the Kings wouldn't be, right? Not until the next round. Yeah, they'd have to leapfrog Edmund. Both of them would have to both, leapfrog. Both of them would have to leapfrog Ed, Edmund. Right, right. Because I just think there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of sparkle on LA's roster that when put in the pressure cooker, I don't think would stand very well. So what I, about I, you, Eddie? Either, which one? Which either that one or Quentin want? Byfield announces his arrival in the playoffs. And, and that too. you know, I don't I don't know if that's that's something we want to see. I, I think it's Vancouver. And for all the reasons that you said, chap, they're also the least physical. Yeah. Of, of and, you know, color Dallas, big body team, you know, right. Colorado, big, fast. Winnipeg, big, fast. I mean, I wouldn't mind Edmonton. I think they're in Edmonton's head. And uh, with with the flux in Edmonton's net combined with the semi-flux in our net, I think the Golden Knights are just a better team. But as far as a series that could lead them further down the road in the playoffs, I think Vancouver will be the easiest, would be the easiest series on them physically. I don't think that Vancouver is anywhere near the team that the Golden Knights playoff team is going to be. And again, then you throw in no experience, first time to the dance. I mean, Tockett is a legitimate Jack Adams candidate. We would agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Probably, As the, he pro- be. right? Probably the favorite. But you know, when the rubber hits the road on April the twentieth or or whatever it is, I don't think that I think they're a bit of a paper tiger. So if they get Vancouver, I think that's a five or a six, and the chances of them coming out of it fairly unscathed going into what will be a titanic second round match against shit anybody who, whoever's there. Yeah, you know, they're not standing. 
<laughs> yeah, it, it you know it's really it's just a matter of where the, where's Bronco going to book book the plane tickets to because they're going they're going somewhere and a war is going to happen. Yeah, we, you okay. know we can that's we're safe doing that. But that's every year for the past like four years. Like that was an inev- inevitability, right? Yeah, I mean the, every year is a war. I think I, when you I, look I, at the moves that some of the teams made, and I guess maybe Dallas was was the least active, but. I mean, they, they did get Tanev. They had right. the least to fix, though. Like, yeah. They've been building a lot more holistically. But, like, you, it'll, you look at the moves the Jets made. You know, obviously, Tyler Toffoli jumps off the, the radar. You look at the moves that, that Colorado made. You look at what Edmonton did. I mean, I don't think Edmonton, by getting Adam Henrique and, and the other kid, Carrick, from, from Anaheim, I don't think that puts them over the edge. But what it does do is it gives them a little bit more depth that they haven't had this season. So everybody in the West who who was a contender went out and did something. The funny thing is, I, I I don't think Nashville really really did anything, right? So here they are. They didn't make any moves. They didn't trade for anybody. They I, I know they sold off pieces. They, they got yeah. the training kid who was the one who knocked Mark Stone out. But, but they have the Ryans, and the Ryans yeah. can lead you through any thistle bushel you could find. Yeah, and and look, I, I I think I think Andrew Burnett is a really good hockey coach, and I think that the New Jersey Devils maybe missed an opportunity last summer when Lindy Ruff's contract was up, and they were debating: Will we? Won't we? Should we? Should we not? And Andrew Burnett was on the staff. I think that's the guy they probably should have hired. They, I mean, look, I know it was it would have been a disservice to Lindy since he was a finalist for the Jack Adams Award, but I felt like Andrew Brunette was a guy that could take you to the next level, and he's doing that with the Predators. So, um, look, it's no matter how you slice it or dice it or whatever cliche that I like to use, and people probably like, come on, man, cut with the fucking cliches, but there's no easy road. No matter what. But, Eddie, I think your point about Vancouver being the least physical, you're going on a quest, right? You're going on this path where you're going to have to go through the meanest, biggest, angriest, most physical teams to raise this trophy at the end of the year. You want to be in a series, especially early, where you're not getting the shit kicked out of you every single night in Vancouver to your point, is that team the only of the only of those teams? I think the L.A. physical one three one awful hockey, but it works. I feel like when I look at both conferences, and this will be unpopular, I'm sure, for all the Golden Knights fans, it feels like the team that comes out of the West might be beat down so badly that the team that comes out of the East is going to win the Cup this year. The gauntlet, the severity of the gauntlet. Think about three. Think about the eight teams in the West. The three series is three series that they have to win to protect just to get to the final. And it just feels like, I mean, the Vegas Golden Knights could conceivably have to go through Vancouver, Edmonton, Colorado. Vancouver. God, that would feel good, though. Oh, like oh no! Chiefs, feel... It'd be like the Chiefs Super Bowl, where it's like you had to go on the road. You had nobody believed in you, and you were able to figure it out. And maybe that team, maybe this team has that. I don't know. I would have bet on it, <laughs> but that could you imagine how that that would you would wear that? Oh yeah, no, no. The depth of defensemen they would need because somebody's going to block a shot, somebody's going to take a chop. Like it's going to be hard. But, yeah. So you let, could get beat up, or you could be so seasoned that the East just cowers. There's that element, too. Well, I mean, when you look at the potential matchups in the East, I don't really think that there's – I mean, Florida-Toronto would be would be interesting. Boston, I think, would play the Capitals. I'm sorry, the Rangers would play the Capitals. So for those what two teams – What are they doing in there? I mean, Boston would have a tough road because they'd have to play Tampa. So you certainly think the Metro Division team is going to have a, an advantage. And look, the Golden Knights, in their defense, they've kicked the shit out of the Rangers both times they played them this year. So yep. uh, yeah. 
You know, I, I, I think the East certainly, much like in years past, the lower teams in the East aren't as good as the lower teams in, in the West. Agreed. Um, and it's been that way for a couple of seasons, and I think that's powered by how strong the Central Division is. I mean, look, you've got three teams mm-hmm. in the Central Division, Winnipeg, Colorado, and Dallas, who could all win the Stanley Cup. I don't think there's three teams in the Metro who you look at and you're like, yeah, three teams could win it. Flyers, nope. Capitals, nope. I think the the Carolina Hurricanes are a maybe. I don't think they're as good as I thought they would be. So, like, yeah, it's 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 a tough road. I mean, the, the East feels like, to me, it's Florida's to lose. Yeah, I, I like the Panthers as well. I, I you know, cool. I just go ahead, Lindsay. Uh, they kind of made their run by punching everybody in the mouth last right. year too. Like they're they're the bu- the biggest bully on the block. You're absolutely correct. And as you guys are talking about like the Metro, it just I think further accentuates just how shitty of a season the New Jersey Devils have had. Yeah, let's because not, it's let's so not talk it's about like, it. I, like <laughs> let's not like, talk about it. So like, and you guys are a second to last. But I digress. But Eddie, like, this just reads like Matthew to Chuck Bully Ball. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, com- completely. Look, let's talk a little bit about the Golden Knights acquisitions. Has Noah Hannafin played himself into a monstrous extension here? In ten, It's 10 games I think he's been here. Chap? It would be, is, go ahead, Lizzie. You're it would cr- be my Christmas wish. It would be my Christmas wish. Right. This guy. He's he now that he's not on the pair with Petrangelo, he's a completely different person. He was really good when he was on the pairing with Petrangelo, but I just think that he Petro's a loud alpha, Hannafin's a quiet one. He needs to be the 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 most important piece on whatever pairing that he's done. And and Nick Hag looks like a new human being yeah. too on the pairing as well. And so we were kind of Spitball in this at the game the other night, Eddie, because as we've talked about at length, uh, Shea Theodore hasn't played the best this year. You know what? That that happens. He's dealt with injury. He's still a great defenseman offensively, but that makes him expendable in my mind because as great as his stretch passes are and his ability to get the puck up the ice, so are Noah Hannafin's, and I think that he does a better job of defensively boxing people out. I. I feel like you have to choose one or the other, especially if we had Marshy into the conversation. But Hannafin, I just every when I watch him, I'm just like, wow. Yeah. I don't get like that about everybody. And, and I'm he's not the trying most, to pump him. He's the most quiet wow, too. Yes. He's yes. he he's not a holy shit, look at this guy. It's an every shift, every second, no mistakes. Just and uh, that's I'm, what this team needs. Right. Like this team needs a guy and needs people that aren't just really good going downhill. And as great as Shane Theodore is about that, you have to have some defensive fortitude that I think Hannafin brings. And and in, in that quiet nature, like he's what I, I I don't even want to put, compare him and Zach Whitecloud because Zach no. is 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 not nearly as offensively gifted and doesn't have the vision. But in terms of, like, if you need him to do that and stay in front of the net, he'll do it. It's just, what are you going to allow him to do? Are you going to allow him to be his best self? Because if so, it can be a really magical thing. You know, Lindsay, you you bring up a point that I don't even think I considered. Um, look, I, I'll, I'll answer the first question, and that's yes. I think priority number one this offseason for the Golden Knights needs to be to sign Noah Hannafin to an extension and get him locked up and keep him here until he's in his early to mid thirties. But I always figured that if they did sign Hannafin to an extension, that they were going to move at least one defenseman in the off season. The thought is that never, ca- count, counting Martinez or not counting? Martinez? Well, no, not counting Martinez, right? He's a UFA. So, but right. the thought never crossed my mind of the possibility of trading Shea Theodore. And I will add this to the discussion. He has never played a full season as a member of the Golden Knights. He always misses a couple, at least a couple of games. He's missed a ton of games this year, obviously. 
He's also entering the last year of his contract. Mm -hmm. That's $5.25 million that you would be able to free up if you moved him in the off season. And here's the other aspect of this. I don't think the Golden Knights would trade Shea Theodore for another player. I think they would acquire draft picks in the process, which means next trade deadline. They got more ammo. Kelly McCrimmon has the opportunity to go out and make more moves to make this team better at the deadline. I mean, look, you've played a ton of games without him this year. You haven't played a ton of games without him and Noah Hannafin in the lineup. I think for the first time, it's crossed my mind that if they did move a D-man, it could be him, which which also leads to you have the potential to also move another one, right? You could move White Cloud or Haig and free up some space because you do have Caden Korzak and Ben Hutton and Lucas Cormier all available to, to you if you if you choose so. This is a team that's going to need cap space in the summer because I, I still think they want to re-sign Marcia So We'll see. But if they don't sign Marcia So and you still have that cap space, you still got William Carrier, you still got Michael Amadio to get signed. And should you choose to bring back Yuri Patera, he's a restricted free agent as well. And I think he's probably your third best goalie. Well, he's obviously your third best goalie. In a, in a, in a, on a team where both goalies in Vegas have had difficult time staying healthy. So it's going to be a really, really interesting offseason. And yeah, you know what? I think the possibility is there that you could trade Theodore at the expense of, of keeping Noah Hannafin. Well, and Eddie, here's the other thing too, because as we've watched him struggle a little bit this year, we watch a lot of the Golden Knights hockey games. Other people I know are scouting too, but there's an element of trying to sell high before value potentially depreciates any further if he's not able to regain the the same level of play that we've become accustomed to seeing from him. What? Let me think of how I want to ask this question to get the answers. When would the Golden Knights have to lose in the playoffs to force Kelly McCrimmon into making those sort of big changes in the the decor. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know, I'm sorry, listeners, that question probably came out super convoluted and mixed up, but there's going to be a point in time where the Golden Knights say, if we lose in this round, this season is not a success. And we're going to make changes. So that's, is it losing in the first round? Is it losing in the second round? Where's the, where, so where's the point where Kelly says, fuck it, got to do something different? I think it's the first two. And chap? honestly, I, but Kelly, before you go to chap two, because McCrimmon says, fuck it without that, that push of we didn't, we underachieved. Right. Like that's already there. Go ahead, chap. I think he already knows. Hold on guys. I, I <laughs> special delivery. I you. This, you said no. The only thing we have to worry about is the fire alarm. No, you know, no, we've got ready. Amazon. Jeff Bezos is at Chapman's oh, door, so Bezos. Chap will be back with us in just a moment. But so there is a point. There is something, and and you know, even though Chap didn't bother to share why exactly he thought that because his doorbell rang, Kelly might already know. He's watching the same stuff we are. Right. He knows. He knows that things have been way, way too uh, soluble. That word comes to my mind for some reason instead of the one that's correct. In front of the net. And whether that's because that snarl isn't there or it's because defensemen are spending too much time skating up and down the ice instead of worrying about that back and forth when you're in front of your own net. Either way, it hasn't been good enough for what you have invested in that blue line. And sometimes you got to take away a piece in order for a new one to be added that could help the entire ecosystem survive better. And I think Shay, as as much as I like him as a player, and obviously I wish the best for him as a as a person. I know that he has a baby on the way. Um, 
I'm I'm worried about the plateau, and I'm worried about Chap with with the edibles. He's never played a full season. Oh, you know? I thought somebody his edibles that he was getting. Yeah, all yeah the money. Money. that was the fire. The fire department came in to check our alarms here in, in my building. Okay. <laughs> Glad we got that out of the way. All right, yeah, so Chap, you yeah, think you think he already knows? Oh yeah, yeah. Look, what what, what separates Kelly McCrimmon from almost every other general manager in the NHL is he is two or three moves ahead of everyone else. You know, he, I would not want to play chess with him a, because I suck at chess and B because he's probably got the ability to think like three or four moves ahead on the chess board. He already knows what he's going to do. And he's already identified what it is that this team needs to compete next season. I would not be shocked in the least to see this team unless they win the Stanley Cup. Then I think all bets are off. If you win the Stanley Cup, then I, I, I don't know what changes would be made. But other than maybe guys asking for more money. But I think he already knows what he's going to do in the offseason. I think he, look, we, we've sat here and we've talked about goalie controversy. We've also brought up the fact that Aiden Hill, who you're paying $4.9 million, has now missed multiple games three times this season due to injury. You also talk about the fact that Logan Thompson is only making $775,000. Both of these guys are free agents next season. They're both unrestricted free agents at the end of next season. I wouldn't be surprised if he's looking at making a move so he could prepare to bring in an elite goalie in two years. I mean, that's the way he thinks. And I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen, that they're going to go out and get another goalie. But the idea that he thinks this far ahead, it's it's it leads credence to the idea that he could be thinking already about who he's going to trade away in the summer. This is a team, look, I, I mean, we don't need to, to, to go too deep into it. They traded away Marc-Andre Fleury coming off of a Vezina trophy. Arguably the most popular player in the franchise at the time. Still one of the most popular players in the franchise, despite the fact that he hasn't played here in three seasons. This is a team that will do whatever they need to do to get better. And they don't care who they need to trade. They don't care who they need to hurt their feelings. They will do it. And as much as I like Shea, I heard Lindsay saying, you know, he's got a baby on the way and I wish him well. And I, I, you know, I wish his family well. And look, I don't want to see him traded. I don't want to see anyone traded. I like all the guys on the team. I like all the guys in the room. But I think there's hockey and then there's feelings. And I think the Golden Knights are in the business of hockey, not feelings, not my feelings, not the feelings of the fans. And to an extent, not the feeling of the players. They want to win. And that's what this is all about. And there's an expense that comes with winning. And that expense is sometimes doing business. Yeah. Sometimes you look, the best CEOs in the world are not guys who are having the coworkers under him over for barbecues every weekend. The best CEOs in the world are guys who are ruthless and they make very difficult decisions day in, day out. And yes, sometimes it, it costs people their, their livelihoods. But his job is not to worry about the guy who's under him. His job is to make the company money. Kelly McCrimmon's job is to make the company or the Golden Knights Stanley Cup champs. He succeeded once. I don't think Bill Foley wants to win just one cup. I don't think Kelly McCrimmon and George McPhee want to win just one cup. I don't think Bruce Cassidy wants to win just one cup. The fans don't want to win just one cup. And there is an expense. And sometimes that expense is you say goodbye to popular players. It's just the way it is. And I don't think anyone on the roster outside of maybe two or three guys are ever 100% fully safe. Because if there's a way to make the team better, Kelly McCrimmon and George McPhee are going to do it. Lindsay? Got nothing to add there. Got nothing? Got nothing? Well, we know, we know what this team is. We know what they're capable of. And when things aren't cutting it, they'll find a sharper edge. Yeah. 
Has anybody seen Anthony Mantha? He's got a couple of assists. He had a really nice one the other night. You had him on a missing poster for the last like seven years, right? Yeah, the, the assist well, he had on the Howden goal was phenomenal. I I have to disqualify myself from the Anthony Mantha conversation <laughs> because I am admittedly bitter and biased because he arrived in Detroit, for all of you who don't know, start his career in Detroit with enormous, enormous upside and potential. And he never ever lived up to it. And He's always been perceived as a player that's very lazy and doesn't ever really engage. And I watched it and I watched it and I watched it to the point where I was sick until they finally shipped him to Washington. And he was almost on his way out in Washington and he's having a 20 goal season. But so if, if you two have something you would like to opine about Anthony right. Mantha, if then us too. Yeah. <laughs> then, then yes, please. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm. I made my prediction in episode seventy three that he will be a healthy scratch in the playoffs. So that's where I'm leaving it. Well, yeah, that's all you have to say about I'll, that. I'll say Go this: ahead, he, he's found a little bit. I don't want to say scoring touch, but he's gotten some points in his last couple games. I, I think he's he had a goal the other night. He's um, got one and two in ten games. I think he's up. He's on a streak. Four, he's up to four points now. Oh, maybe there's one and three. Yeah. Okay. But the assist he had on the Howden goal where he gloved it down, I I mean, look, that's that's due to height. That's the benefit of him being six foot five, six yeah. foot nine on skates, chap. I know it's not <laughs> his game, but with his size and speed, I want to see more of a power forward from him. And not his game, bro. I, I just I'm don't just, yeah. It's not it's not you're his, asking him to take initiative. It's just yeah. not who he is as a player. Um, I mean, I lo- I liked that he said he needed to be better. To ha- make a self-aware statement, I, I like it. But uh, unfortunately, my track record says until he goes out and he is better, him saying he needs to be better doesn't He's cut it from better. He's got three, goal- three points in his last four games. I mean, Man, the for Conn Smythe, book it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> book it right now. <laughs> Everything yeah. you have on it. He goes on a heater. <laughs> I'm starting to feel queasy. Genuinely haven't noticed him. And that's probably a bigger indictment on a player than really anything. Like, I'd, I'd rather you fuck up big. Like, yeah. Trying to make a play and taking a chance. I genuinely don't know his jersey number off the top of my head. I haven't noticed him. It's 39. <laughs> and for somebody that's like 6'5 and apparently all size and speed, I would think that I would notice him more. But I might be just too infatuated with Noah Hannafin skating. So I, I too, have a bias. And it is efficient hockey play. All right, and, chap. That uh, means the only so unbiased. It's all chap. It's all chap. Go ahead. You've got the floor, sir. Make your case. Well, I think I think to a point, yeah, he, he has been difficult to notice. Um, sometimes I don't even know he's out there. I don't know what line he's Right. <laughs> you know? he's, he's there, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, look, I, I mean – I hope he gets going, but I mean, at this point, yeah, I mean, Tomas Hurdle comes back and you look at the roster now to be fair, William Carrier was out last night. So that obviously jumbles things a little bit, but I don't think you're taking Pavel Dorofeyev out of the lineup. I really don't. I mean, if you ask me right now, Anthony Mantha, Pavel Dorofeyev, I'm taking Mantha out of the lineup if it's between those two. Pavel Dorfeyev has turned into a really, really good player. I think he's got now 11 goals, and he's only played like 32 games. He's in the cage. He's in the cage. Yeah, he he gets to the area that you want to see Mantha get to. Mm -hmm. And I think Bruce raves about him. Not even in the EA Sports game does Mantha go to the crease. But but Bruce (laughs) loves Pavel. Every time... Like the question I asked Bruce Cassidy on Saturday night after that game, where basically I asked him a question and he took it 10 steps further to go on about what a great kid Dorofeyev is and how he he goes out there and he plays hard and he wants to be this good player and how he works hard to adjust and how the room has really brought him in and, and made him part of the group. and. 
you know, it's I think he's a player where you have him with William Carlson. Like for the longest time, I thought the pairing was Amadio and Carlson. I think the pairing is Amadio Dorofeyev. And that kind of goes to show you how good William Carlson is that you could put Michael Amadio on his side. You could put Pavel Dorofeyev on the other side. And both guys are really good players. I think the difference with Dorofeyev as opposed to some of the other guys, you could put him with Chandler Stevenson and he's still noticeable when he's out there on the ice. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. let's let's finish up with uh, the road ahead. Uh, tomorrow night, the Golden Knights will visit the s- suddenly struggling Winnipeg Jets. And then Saturday, night, they conclude this four-game gauntlet of a road trip against the, unfortunately, I have to say this, fading quickly Minnesota Wild. Finally. The the, the, the Wild are, uh, let's see, 77, 86, nine points back of the Golden Knights for the second wild card with a game in hand. So the Golden Knights have three points out of a possible four uh, on this road trip. When we talked about this road trip on episode 73, we're like, holy shit, this is make it or break it. There is a decent betters chance that they could get seven points out of eight on this road trip. Well, I don't, I don't want to put the cart before the horse because I think they had three points out of their, on their first two games on their last road trip when they went back to Ottawa and Buffalo and Toronto. I think they, they lost in overtime to the Senators, and then they beat the Maple Leafs. I think that was the next game. And then they lost the remaining three games on that road trip, including to the Sabres and the Blue Jackets. This doesn't feel like that team, it though. It doesn't because it seems like they're playing better. But I think if you win one of the next two, you come back with five points. It's fantastic. You're happy. You know, and I think if you and, – and I'll take it a step further. If you're going to win one of them, the game against the Wild is more important than the game against the Jets. You're not the, – the, the Jets don't matter. And if you can get that game to overtime and you win it in overtime, I don't give a shit if the Jets get a point either. Just like no. I didn't give a shit if the Predators got a point last night. The idea that you want teams ahead of you to lose and the teams behind you to win is, is stupid. So – I want the Wild to lose, and I don't give a shit if they lose to the Jets. Get a point in that game. Get two points in that game. But if you're going to win one of the next two, beat the Minnesota Wild and end their season. Make them a non-factor the rest of the way, which is what you have an opportunity to do when you go to the XL Energy Center on Saturday afternoon. You have an opportunity to end their season and make them a non-factor. Sort of like what sort of like what they did to uh, Seattle. Seattle. Yes. You know they're going to play Flurry in that game, and he's going to either get lit up or be amazing. Right? You know, I watched he the didn't, He didn't play the last time they played him. Maybe not. I if if there is a situation where you have to do or die this game yeah, for they're Minnesota, going with and they're playing no, they're Vegas going with Golden Knights. Yep, yep, yep. Andre Flurry. Yep, yep, will yep. Be doing break dancing in his <laughs> trees. That guy lives for that shit. I would live for that shit. That gets me going. I want. I would want Minnesota to give their absolute greatest game possible for him and for that whole thing. Uh, but you're right. I, I'm with you, Chap, in terms of their importance of winning the two. No amount of points is going to make me happy with this hockey team. And so... Well, that's, um, that's kind of what I wanted to go to. They have 86 yeah. points with 10 games to go. We've just said that Jets and Wild are next. But after the Jets in the wild, Vancouver, the v- very difficult to play uh, Arizona Coyotes. They're just difficult for the Golden Knights. They're not difficult for anybody else in the league. Um, but then it's Canucks, Oilers, Wild again, Avs, and then a couple of cupcakes at the end, the Blackhawks and the Ducks. So they have 86 points. There's 10 games left. There's 20 points possible. Theoretically, the the well, not theoretically, the actual max is 106. Where where are the Golden Knights going to end up? 
You want to you want to hazard a guess to send us out since we like to always end with predictions and things like that. You always ask it with numbers. This is my absolute worst nightmare. Are you asking for like the golden number of points to get in the playoffs? Well, I think they're good. I think actually, I think that's sort of decided. I think there's enough okay. clear, clear clearance there between uh, the Golden Knights and the Blues. They are they're six points apart. I mean, not completely clean and clear. But if you ask me what my concern level with them not making the playoffs is, it's pretty oh. small now. It's, yeah. It's it, it, it's pretty small. So if they have 86, if they go 5-5, five and five, they end up with 96. Right? I think that one, uh, one, two, well, they got the last two, four. I feel like they win six out of the, six out of the last ten. And that gets them 98. Does that seem like reasonableness? Because the, everybody was saying the golden number was 97. Well, he's obsessed with Connor McDavid. It's so annoying. I think, I think, you know, when you look at, I think they split the next two. Um, I think they'll, they'll, I think they'll lose to Winnipeg tomorrow. And I think they'll beat the wild on Saturday. Right. I think they'll beat Vancouver at home and they'll beat the coyotes at home. Then I think they lose. Uh, Coyotes is on the road. Yeah, I'm sorry. The mullet. So I'm looking at two and two through the Coyotes game. I think they'll lose the Vancouver and Edmonton. And then I think they come home and win three of their next four. So what's that? Six and four? Yeah, pretty much. So yeah, I I think 96 is the number. I think that's where. Or 98. 98, I think, is what they end up with, which I think keeps them in the eighth slot. I don't think they catch LA and I don't think they catch Nashville. I mean, I haven't looked at the Kings schedule, but I think, I don't know. I just think that, that the Kings are going to find a way to win a, a couple more games than the golden Knights down the stretch. And if you're Vegas, I mean, I don't really, I mean, look, I'm looking at their schedule and it's certainly not easy. They also, so the Kings, they won on Monday in Vancouver. Um, now they have Edmonton, Calgary, Winnipeg. So pretty, pretty tough stretch all on the road. And then they're home for Seattle. And then they've got they they've got a lot of games against Western Conference. In fact, every game for, for them remains literally all of them. Yeah. So and a bunch of them against the Pacific, but they've got San Jose and Anaheim. They've got two games with Anaheim, one game with San Jose, one game with Chicago. I think that gives them an edge. They also have a couple of games with the Flames, which I think they'll probably split. So that's five wins right there, I think. So, you know, if you're Vegas, I don't really think you give a shit if L- if you're playing, if L.A. finishes ahead of you. Let them worry about Edmonton. So not numbers, Lindsay. Just pick this. Pick the win-loss for the last 10. No, I'm not going to even do that. I'm going to pick uh, that there's going to be a goalie duel in Minnesota. That is going to catalyst Logan Thompson into a heat of all heaters. I am going to predict that Nick Hag scores two goals before the end of the regular season by one way or another. And I think, I think that's, that's about uh, the, what was your question? The non-numbers question? (laughs) Wins and losses for the last 10 games. (laughs) I'll go. I'll go. And four. What? Six and four. We're all we're all going with the six and four. All right, I'm gonna go oh, six. I'm, I'm going six three and one. Oh, switch Why it up. Are you? I'm, I'm ninety nine six three and one ninety nine. That's it. Yeah. We're done. We've been on for an hour. <laughs> Episode seventy four was all over the place, but I hope you were able to follow it. If you like the content, please hit the subscribe button that pops up there on your screen uh, throughout the episode. I want to thank, as always, the Las Vegas Advisor, www.lasvegasadvisor.com, and Dr. John Pierce at Ageless Forever, www.agelessforever.net, for always taking care of us and making sure we have enough money to keep doing these episodes. We will probably catch up with you again on Wednesday, April the 3rd, after the Golden Knights have their one game homestand against Vancouver. We'll have a whole lot more clarity on the playoff picture and a whole lot more drama in net and the injured reserve list. And if the rumor is correct, 
Tomas Hurdle will make his debut on April the 2nd against the Vancouver Canucks. So there's a lot to talk about going down the stretch. Thanks, everybody, for your loyalty and listening uh, for all these years. We really appreciate it, and we will see you next week. Take care. 